Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 15, verses 13 through 21. That's page 982 in your pew Bibles. I'll give you a minute to look that up. And then uh, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's word. And I'll begin in verse 13. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will, will set it up, so that the rest of the mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those, those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them and to abstain from things, things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things uh, strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preached him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. And the children can be dismissed uh, to Children's Church. I've got a, a theory uh, about something. I, not necessarily, my theories aren't necessarily always right. I just, uh, it's just a thought. Uh, but uh, I'll share it with you. I, it was interesting. I was talking to a, one of the girls. Uh, Kim had made the meals for the girls at the retreat, and I got to sit in on uh, meal time with uh, some of the girls at one of the tables and this one girl was studying to be an actress. She went out to do an internship out in Los Angeles and she had a great experience out there. And she was so glad that Los Angeles wasn't what she had heard it was. So many people rip on California. They just um, say bad things about the people that are out there and, and uh, the place and she was so encouraged because she met all these great people, many people that love the Lord, and uh, just had a great experience out there, as, as I did when I had opportunity to go out there too. And, um, but I got a theory about that, and part of it is, you see what you are. If you're looking for people to be jerks, you'll see them. Um, if you're looking for kindness in people, then you will see that also. Um, and if you have bad view of people, even if somebody's being nice to you, you're wondering why they're being nice to me. You can't just enjoy the fact that there's actually some nice people out there. Another theory I have, or another thought I have, is we never really leave high school. So some of you are the, you're like you're really close. You're on the cusp of leave, leaving. You're, you're stuck in it the rest of your life. And you're thinking, now what do you mean by that? Uh, I think about like the Oscars, or I think about professional athletes, or I think about all the different stuff that is out there that, that some of you are like, I could care less about. Um, but we're all in this big high school, and there's these people that are really, really good at stuff, whether it be sports or acting, they're just the popular ones. That people will actually buy magazines about them and their life, and we've even had a whole another section called reality stars that are <laughs> living reality. And uh, people are caught up in that, and they want to know what's going on with this person and that person, who's getting married and stuff. And they're just the popular people. They're just the popular segment of the big old high school that we're all living in. And we're just living life. We're just doing our studies. We're just doing our homework. But then there's these other people 
that are just amazing. And these are people that are so good at what they do, they get to the point where they get lots of money to do this stuff. And they'll take a ball and they'll cross a, an end zone line and then they'll start doing these dances and they'll do all this stuff and they'll, you know, look at the ref and they'll, you know, pull a Sharpie out of their shoe and write, you know, and just make this big thing and everything, oh, they're amazing. And they're celebrating something. It's their job. <laughs> Could you imagine if we all did that? Honestly. If I did that after every sermon. <laughs> You guys would go, dork, you know. <laughs> but we, we put up with it. And, and like even tonight, and I enjoy watching uh, the Oscars because I think it's a barometer of what's going on in society today. And, and there will be people that will come up and they'll get the, the award. They'll get it. And they'll, they'll talk about this, these different things. And, and I think about times past where like um, Marlon Brando had won it for Godfather. And he didn't even show up, and he had told them, I'm not going to show up. And he wins the award. And so this Native American lady makes her way up, and she's, and they try, I remember Roger Moore is trying to hand it to her, and she goes, and then she says, I've got something I want to share. Mr. Brando is not going to accept this award tonight because of the treatment of the American Indian in film today. But I won't give the whole long speech right now, but if you do want to hear about it, later I'm willing, I'm thinking, how many people showed up for that thing? You know, but that's what Brando did. We've got Sally Field who would um, win the award. She had won it for the second time and she gets up there and then she says, and the first time I got it, it just never really hit me. But now, now I realize you like me. You really, really like me. <laughs> and I thought, this poor woman. She wants so badly to have that acceptance. And we could go on and on with the different ones and how they have accepted the award. And it's your job. It's what you're paid to do. So when you receive the award, here's what I'd love to hear. Thank you. And, and leave. You, or, but they'll make this political thing out of it, or they'll make this, this thing of, you know, and you're all amazing, and, 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 and like, like they're the popular ones in the high school that nobody else could do what we do. We are so amazing. And so I watch it, and part of it is it breaks your heart because they're just, it's their job. And many of you should be getting some awards. And I'm not, I'm not just saying that you should get awards. Isn't it good to know that when it's all said and done, the one who truly watches at some point will reward? And it'll be pure, it'll be total, the motives of the heart, it, it, it'll be the, the, the cleanest because it will truly be what should be rewarded. And there are rewards. Isn't that interesting? The Bible doesn't steer clear of that. There's some people, oh, no, I don't. God says, you do this. You walk with me. Your heart is right. You follow me. You will be rewarded. The Bible teaches this. He teaches this in glory. Heaven isn't all going to, you know, it's like everything's equal. It literally is something very, very special. I, I don't even understand, but God does. And he's the rewarder, the true judge that, will, that sees all and understands all. And that should actually humble us. That should just floor us and make us very much aware, what am I doing with this? Because that's eternity. We, we invest so much in, in the 70 years. We're not even promised that. It's like, oh, I build my kingdom and I'll invest the time in this and I'll do this. And God, the judge, is watching. What are you doing with me? What are you doing? So let's pray. And then let's look at 
um, a, a speech, uh, a, 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 uh, what I entitled the perfect acceptance speech here as, as James will step up and, and he'll have something to say in this council. So let's, let's talk to the Lord right now. Father, thank you for this opportunity once again to open your word and, and to have you speak to us. And thank you that you're the one in charge. You're one, you've given each of us gifts. Uh, you've, you've, those of us that have called on your name and have received Jesus Christ as our Savior. We've got a home in heaven that is so great. But while we're here, what we do with you. And that has bearing on us as husbands and wives and, and um, children and parents and uh, all of these different relationships, friends with one another. God, this has bearing. So even the Monday through Friday, the, the, the 9 to 5, these are acts of worship, loving you and, and loving people. God, you got to help us with this. Help us to have that viewpoint. So thank you, Lord. I ask you to do your thing once again this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to take notes, there's a section in your bulletin to, to fill in and, and work through together. We're going to have some scriptures we're going to look at, and they'll be up on the board here in a moment here. But I want you to have your Bible there open to Acts 15. If you don't have a Bible, there's one on the pew rack right in front of you. Please grab that and, and open it to Acts 15. And, and first point for today is know your audience. Boy, a person that when they're doing a speech, that what a great thing to know your audience to know who you're talking to. That's huge. I'm speaking to a bunch of Americans that look really tired. And so I'm going to try to keep you going here. Uh, you, you, I don't know what Saturday looked like for you, but, um, but here we are. So know your audience. Look at verse 13 with me of chapter 15. He says, after they finished speaking, so these had, had stepped up and they had said what they had said, and now after they finished speaking, James replied, brothers... Listen to me. And so this is a Jerusalem council. It's, it's predominantly Jewish. There might be some people with some Jewish blood and some Gentile blood. But for the most part, this is, this is a Jewish audience. And so he understands this. They, he says, they finished speaking, and then James gave this final speech in defense of salvation by grace. And so if you didn't get it before, salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing. So he's, he's, he's stressing that. And so he steps up and he knows his audience. He knows he's, who he's going to be talking to. And that's just, that's huge. That's huge when you're communicating. Secondly, secondly, to have a perfect acceptance speech, understand your roots. You understand where you came from. Understand where, your roots. Look at verse 14 with me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them from them a people for his name. So James is just summarizing Peter's first point. God had saved Gentiles by grace years earlier. He had, he had talked about what had happened with Cornelius and, and uh, what, you know, what had taken place. Look at verse 15. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as is, writ is written. So he points to the words of the, the prophet Amos. So he's going to use the prophet Amos. And he's going to say that Gentiles, he's going to show how Gentiles would be saved. So he's using an Old Testament. Remember, he knows his audience. So he's talking to predominantly Jews. And so he would take out of their books one of their prophets and he would use it. Interesting, I want you to see this because this is, this is important. He's quoting from Amos, but he's quoting from the Septuagint. Okay, and the Septuagint was a Greek translation of the Old Testament book, which to me is, is cool because what it says is that God used even translations back then. It's, I don't have to have the Hebrew text and the Greek text for God to speak to me. There's a translation that God is using, and by the Spirit of God, he is also commentating on the text as it's going on. And so this help, these are things that help me because as I'm speaking with somebody about things of the Lord, I want to get the scriptures right, so I try to memorize scripture. But also there is, le there is, there is a freedom that as I'm sharing it, that it, I, it is okay that I commentate on it 
if my commentation or comments, that's good, are lining up with scripture. And so I'll say to somebody, for example, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I'll say, for by grace you have been saved. And so I try, then I try to explain that. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And I'll ask, do you know what a gift is? And I'll start talking. So that no one can brag about it. Now, the, the word that usually is, so no man can boast, but I'll say nobody can brag about it. Nobody can make a big deal about the fact that I did this thing. It's, it's all a gift of God. And so as I'm sharing Scripture with somebody, I'm also explaining as I go. And it helps me to think about it a little bit more. Because what can happen with people is you just start quoting verses and I remember I used to do this, especially with the King James, great translation. God used it very great in my life, still does. But I would talk about spiritual things, and I would kick it into a King James translation. And I would have the, this kind of talk, and then I'd come back and do American Mark talk. And so for a little while when I'd do that stuff, they'd go, I could just see the look on their face like, now, let me get this straight. So... When I'm talking about God, I have to talk in old English. But when you, then you come back, it's almost like a commercial, and, I, and I, I'm trying to get you. And so what I found is, even if I'm using the King James, I'm helping them along with understanding. Does that make sense? So it's important that as we're sharing with people that they get what we're saying. We have to know our audience or we're not communicating. And so James... Out of love for them, instead of, go, instead of right away start talking about what happened in, earlier in the book of Acts, or even quoting Jesus, he goes back to one of their guys and says, I'm going to use it, but he explains it. So look what he says here. He says, verses 16 through 18, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. This is speaking of kingdom. Gentiles will be saved as Gentiles without first becoming Jews, or else verse 17 does not make sense. There's nothing in here about being circumcised. There's nothing in here about following the Jewish rites or religious techniques or steps. Gentiles, in fact, will be brought to God in the kingdom. Look at this. This, is, this, this verse should humble those that read it. Zechariah 8, 20 through 23. God is not done with Israel. And I want you to just enjoy this. Zechariah, this is one of the last books of the Old Testament, a prophet. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts. People shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples, and this is, so this is talking about all of the world. This is, this is exciting what God does. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days... Ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take the robe of a Jew, this is so awesome, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Isn't that cool? So that what the Jewish heart should be would, be, would be, now let me get this straight, I put my robe on, and I got ten Gentiles around me, and they're grabbing on to me, and they're following. It's the first entourage, all right? And they're following, it's, it, and they're, they're going, I'm sticking with you because you know God, and you're going to bring me to the true God into the kingdom. That's the, that was the whole thing that the Jew was supposed to do. It, they were blessed to be a blessing. And so I look at it as like, for every one Jew, ten Gentiles are making their way in. Isn't that cool? That God would have that kind of heart? That that's his heart. Now, let's, let's go a little bit further. I think that's God's heart for us that have been blessed to do this thing called church. It's not just for us. It's, we're blessed to be a blessing. So that when people, when people look at us, they go, I'm with you 
because wherever you're going, you're into God. So they wouldn't be like wondering, are they into God? I mean, they do the church thing, but I, I don't see, they've got other priorities and stuff. That, that he never really comes up. He, you're into God. And so they would be like, I'm holding on to your toga, baby. We're going in. This is, this is, the, this is the heart of God, that this group of people. And so he's saying to them, and you'd think that they'd be sitting there going, because what they've been holding on to, they've been holding on to their rules. They can't be in the club until they start following the rules of the club. The he, man, woman, you know, whatever it is. And God says, we, I want you in. His point is that Gentiles will be in the kingdom without becoming Jewish proselytes. Then they don't have to go through this process before the kingdom. They did it in the kingdom. They're going to do it pre-kingdom. So we have this here. God's called us to this. Look at verse, uh, or point number three. Remember your time. So you've got know your audience, understand your roots, and remember your time. You'll see some of these people that do these acceptance speeches, and you're like, get to the point. Or even then, the band starts up. Because it's like, if they could just shut up, think, and move on. And so he's remembering his time, and he comes, he comes here and he says, but now I have to say something. And this, this is huge. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Keeping the law and observing rituals were not requirements for salvation. The Judaizers were forbidden to trouble the Gentiles by teaching otherwise. This word trouble was so, was so good for me to, to get a picture. And if you guys could imagine, think of it over the years, whether when you were a kid or when you had your children and they were in the back there and you were on a long trip. So think about that for a second. And one is troubling the other. I don't know if you ever had that. Okay, if you didn't, we got to talk because that's just that's not normal. It's a, oh, my children, they always behave and they never were bad. I'm going, you are blind, all right? At some point, they're all evil, okay? It's just part of the deal, and it's okay. That's what the beatings are for. No, that's what... That, and so, and it got, you know, you're, you know they, they learn how to duck because you're driving and trying. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but the word trouble, listen, listen to the word here, what it means. Trouble is to, to throw something in the path of someone to annoy them. You ever have that when you're, maybe you're trying to do some studying and somebody like, they just... And you just keep... Give me attention. I know you're busy with important things, but it's about me. Yeah. <laughs> Schneider, you know how to annoy. Uh, so, it, so it's one of those things where it's like just, just little Chinese water torture type thing. Stop! This is the word. This is what's going on. This group of people that, that have gotten saved by grace through faith, God has changed them. They're not, they did just pray a prayer. They did just fill out a card, and they just keep living a certain way. That's a whole nother discussion. He's talking about people that God has saved, and he's working on, he's sanctifying, he's saving them. And they're sitting there, and these, these leaders just throw on something to them. You got to do this. You got to do that. You, you just, you never do enough. There's, there's one more thing on the list. Yeah, I know it's grace by faith, but you've got to follow the club rules. And just do, do. Can you see how that could be annoying? None of us, none of us would like it. The, 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 the most religious Jewish follower here wouldn't have liked it. Because you spend enough time with somebody, you know what bugs them. You know it. And that's what was going on. And James, out of love, has said here, my judgment, verse 19, is that we should not annoy, we should not keep bugging those of the Gentiles who turn to God. 
But, now this is, this is cool because some of you, when you hear these salvation by grace through messages, some of you just cringe. You're like, you just, if you keep it up, there's going to be people hanging from these chandeliers. I just know it. Dancing, you know, doing a bunch of stuff that just, you get nervous when you hear that. But God's a God of balance. And he, so he says here something, and I, and I just think it's, it's huge that we look at it for a second here. Because it's obviously here, we should look at it. Verse 20, he says, But should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. Hmm. Let's go through those for, for a moment here. So he's saying a letter should be written. And he's saying abstain from these things or th these things should not be a part of their lives. And by the way, so he's talking to this audience who are predominantly Jewish. And he's saying to them, I, I don't want you to keep annoying. Don't keep bugging them with stuff. But it's not a bad thing to write them. This. So let's look through the list just for a moment here. What's the list? It says, abstain from idols, food offered to pagan gods and then sold in uh, temple butcher shops. Uh, what was going on is, uh, and there was so much that was tied to idolatry in the Gentile world. So much. And, um, and so you'd have these Jewish believers that were doing, they, they had received Christ and now they're saved and but they brought with them and we I've talked about this before their backpack of Jewishness or Judaism with them and so they they would um, in what was going on in like let's say Ephesus people would bring meat or sacrifices to the goddess Diana for a sacrifice and so the priests and the priestesses and all these different people would, you know, kill that, do the sacrifice. And there was so much brought in because people wanted to appease these gods that out back or someplace tied to it was a temple butcher shop where that meat could be on sale compared to another place. And so Gentile believer who thinks food sacrificed to idols or food, just regular food, even God says in one of the epistles, it's either or. No, it's not sinning to have that. So they'd go down there and they'd, well, it's, it's, it's the Aldi of meat. Okay, I'm trying to translate it here, okay? You could go to, and I don't want to name a name of some other big place, okay? A butcher place that has amazing meat but costs a lot, Okay. Um, I don't want to go there because I don't want to spend the money. Say, I'll just get it here. So they, then they go and they cook it and they sit down for a meal. And the Jewish person is sitting there. And they're loving it. They're going, this is amazing. Where did you, this is just so, yeah, I got it on sale at Temple blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so earlier they're enjoying this meal. But now they're, in, they're getting like retroactive stomach aches because it's like, but this was offered to idols. Does that make sense? So why that would bother, bother them? Okay. Because they, they can't separate the two. In their mind, they're sinning. Let's keep going a little bit farther. Sexual immorality is a, is a no-brainer. Sexual sin in general. This was so much a part of pagan worship. And, uh, and that's also a moral issue. Each, by the way, each one of these things is fellowship issues. Of these four that are listed, they're fellowship issues. Sexual immorality is a moral issue also. And so they're saying we, we have to separate ourselves so much from this because that culture, that pagan Gentile culture that knows nothing, they would look at that because even in their churches for their idol worship, that's part of the worship. And so he's saying, you've got to separate yourself. So there isn't even in some, one of the epistles a hint of this. 
Then he says something else. He said, those things that are uh, from, from what has been strangled and from blood. See, blood had to be completely removed out of the meat for the Jew. And so if this animal, for whatever reason, I'm thinking of strangling, but that would go on, that doesn't free up the blood. Something had to be pierced so that the blood would drain out and then the meat could be eaten. But for us in the new economy, it's okay. So some of you are like, you mean I can't have a little pink? You know, you're, you're, you're thinking, you know, how does this apply to me today? All of these things, apart from the sexual immorality, there's freedom. But it's a fellowship issue concerning believers knowing your audience. There's a group of Jewish people that all their lives have been taught don't eat food sacrificed to idols, the sexual immorality, a no-brainer there. And then, not strangled, but the blood, having any blood in it, I bring that in me because the law told me I cannot have that. So to have fellowship with these people, and out of love for them, I wouldn't put that before them. I would love them enough that I wouldn't wouldn't say, yeah, we got the temple, and I can get it at the temple butcher shop, and there's nothing you can do about it. I guess not eat it. I'll just eat it. And if there's blood in it, so what? There's nothing wrong with that. But in that person's mind, there is something wrong. There's God's point through James. God's point is, I love these people enough to go without certain things so as not to offend them. And that's what love does. Look at the last verse here, verse 21. For from ancient generations Moses has had, has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. He's saying, you do realize... Jewish audience, as we're talking about salvation by grace through faith, that in synagogues there are still people reading Moses. There's still people that no matter what, they'll keep picking up that backpack and they'll put it on. And so out of love for them, I'm going to steer clear of food that's been offered to idols and that idolatry. I'm going to steer clear of sexual immorality and not even have a hint of it. I'm going to steer clear of the strangled and, and make sure that the blood isn't in that because I love them. Do you know there's always been laws? Whenever man's been around, there's always been laws. There, in the garden, there was one rule. There was one law. Don't eat from that tree. There's been conscience. There's been human government. There's been the law. In the church, there's rules. In the kingdom, there will, there will, there will even be law. In fact, let's look at, just for a moment, just quickly... What's supposed to govern us? What, what's this supposed to be the thing that, that, that impacts our lives right now? Let's look at this together. Okay, and this is where the verses will come on the screen. If you want to write them down and be helpful, you can look at it later. John 13, 34, and 35. John 13, 34, and 35. A new command. This is Jesus as he's washing feet and as he's spending time with the disciples just before he's going to die for us. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So, I, I'm supposed to love you. You're supposed to love me. The world will know it's the difference if we love one another. Even if we're being interesting, somehow, why do they love each other? Because God's done something. And then another way of, of loving you is, is there a burden? Is there something that's been, and I somehow try to pick up and help you with that? That's a way of showing love to you. Galatians 5, 13 through 15. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love... Serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out, 
that you are not consumed by one another. So that's what should be mark a, a church family, is that we love one another. Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves, him, who loves another has fulfilled the law. So the law, you're, you're, I think as you're hearing this, so the law is I'm supposed to love you. James 1, 22 through 25. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, by the way, doesn't that look like an oxymoron? The law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. James 2, verse 8. James 2, verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. And then Galatians 5, 16 through 25. How can I do this? I, I just, I, I hear you say that, but how do I do this? But I say walk by the Spirit. Are you, have you asked the Lord even today, God, I want to walk by your Spirit. Assignment. Ask the Lord, God, I want to walk by your Spirit. I, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. That's a good word. So we got this group of people that are that he knows his audience, and he's saying to them, this is what would be, um, let's quit annoying, let's quit, quit frustrating, but let's write him a letter and tell him to abstain for those four things. And uh, actually, c probably three if you put the blood and the strangled together there. Because there's a group of people that, that bring that backpack with them. Because they're still hearing about Moses in their synagogues. And so out of love, I'm willing to give up certain things. That's what love does. That's what the law of love does. And we could look at that and go, yeah, I know, that's great, but what does it have to do with me? I mean, I, I'm probably gonna, I could leave here and go to Texas Roadhouse and I could say, a little pink of the blood, and you wouldn't be sinning. So what does it have to do with me? There may be people here sitting in this church right now that um, have certain things that they, they pick up in their church backpack and they hold to as dear. They, they look at that and they would go, boy, this is the definition of a Christian. And by the way, one of my jobs, I believe, as pastor is to keep coming back to and keep sharing what the Word says a Christian looks like, which is a lot of things, but mostly it's heart issues. But there are some people that get caught up in the externals. I'll give you an example. And by the way, I don't mind this, okay? So if you're sitting there going, he's whining, I'm not. There's other times I whine, and I'll tell you, so. I wear a suit on Sunday. On Sunday, okay? If you come Wednesday, you can see some ugly legs sometimes where I wear my shorts, but um, 
And there may be even people that that's a hard thing for them too. But I wear a suit on Sunday mornings. Do you know why I do that? You look so amazing in it. That's true. <laughs> I do it, and it's a way of saying to all of you, I love you. But there may be some people that if I wore something else, and I wore it on a regular basis, it would be, it'd be hard for them. I'm just telling you. They just cannot, they could not separate. And by the way, I think it's fine and professional, things along that line. But if I didn't wear it, would I be okay with God? Yeah, that's, yes is the answer to that one, all right? <laughs> so you're like, I don't know. There's other things, you know. Um, but I, and I'll continue to do that. That's just how I feel, okay? Um, and there may be some of you, like, you're wearing a suit all week. And you're like, please. And I'm, by the way, I'm not asking to have a rule. I'm not. But for me, that's fine. And I could start listing other things, and if I start listing them, or even things that I'd like to do, it, all the thing that would be rest, the, the thing that would be in your mind is, oh, he wants to do that. I don't want you even having that on your brain. But that thing wouldn't necessarily be sin. There are certain things that I do not do because I think if I did them, it would hurt you. And it's just, and I could do them. But because I love you, I won't do that. And because I love a, a certain section, that it would just, they, they could not, they can't fathom that. There, by the way, I just want you to know, you may not know this, there are standards that people have for Christians that aren't in the Bible, but they really believe them. They can do them. But we better not. And so I, as, as I'm sharing that, you have to come to grips with between you and the Lord. What has such a hold of me that I'm not willing to give up? Whatever it may be, and I'm, by the way, that I didn't, I, there's not one person I'm, I can say before God, there's not one person I'm targeting at all in this message. God's working on me on this all the time. And that's, by the way, isn't that what love does? We do it all the time. Because we love one another. One more word. Because I think there could be people sitting there going, now he's starting to get it. And if we started doing this as a church, we'd do blah, 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 okay? Some of you, I don't know of anybody in particular, but some of you live to just keep trying to annoy you guys. Nothing's working, all right? But you, uh, Joe Aldrich wrote a book called Lifestyle Evangelism. And in it, he talked about the people that have been doing church for a long time. They are professional weaker brethren. They live to make, they live to be offended. Well, that offends me, that offends me. That offends me. Grow up! Because when you say, that offended me, you know what that meant? I caused you to sin. That's a whole nother talk. And by constantly saying you're offended, you are admitting you're the weaker brethren. Well, I'm not that. I'm amazingly strong. And why do you keep getting offended? The beauty of the Word of God is the balance. I need to be willing to look at somebody and say, I'm willing to give up this thing. I'm not going to hold rigidly to it and, and say, no, I can, this, I, I'm allowed to do this. That's what love does. And then on the other side, it's not constantly looking to be offended. It's that balance. It's what the Word teaches. Romans talks a whole thing about stumbling blocks. Boy, doesn't the law of love cover it all? 
I don't know around your house, I, I, don't, I haven't been in every one of your homes, but I don't know if you have on your wall for your children and you, thou shalt not kill. Or uh, just a reminder, let's not kill each other. Is somebody heaven? <laughs> or other, other things that you would go, well, that, that is against the law. So I guess we should put that up as a reminder. You don't have to. Because if I love Kim, it's a, it's a no-brainer. I don't do this, and I do do this. If I love my children, it's, I don't have to have that written on the wall. Oh, that's right. Don't strangle them. No, don't. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what it's, okay. It's, I don't. Why? Because I love them. My encouragement to you today, let's follow the law of liberty, the law of love, for how we treat one another. Because we'd want it when it comes to the Lord. We'd want it. Let's be more, let's be as gracious. I'm telling you, I have seen over the years the graciousness of this church family. You've been so grace, gracious toward me. And I thank the Lord for you. Let's keep growing. Let's keep going. Let's pray.